Grace and peace be with you. On the Wednesday after Easter, Kurt Hansen invited anyone that was interested to take the time to listen to Bach's St. John Passion and then to talk about it after we'd listened to it. Now, Kurt has sung the St. John Passion many, many times. He knows it intimately and he loves it deeply. There is nothing better than listening to someone describe something they love. And that was very true about what Kurt shared about this piece of music. His love for it was infectious. I was familiar with the St. John Passion, but I hadn't listened to it for years. So I sat down and paid attention to it again and immersed myself in Bach's beautiful music. It's based on the passion story taken from the Gospel of John. And there's one soloist, the evangelist, who sings words that are taken directly out of the Bible story. But then in between scenes, there are arias and chorales that pause the action in order to reflect on what's happening. As the story goes, as Jesus is dying on the cross, you might remember that the light of the sun goes out and the land is covered in darkness. And at the moment of Jesus' death, there's an earthquake, the rocks crumble, the thick curtain of the temple is torn in two, and the whole earth shakes at the death of Christ. At that moment in Bach's masterpiece, a tenor voice sings these words. The entire world with Jesus' suffering likewise suffers. The sun drapes itself in mourning. The curtain is rent. The crag crumbles. The earth trembles. The graves split open since they behold the creator growing cold. I'd never really thought of the death of Christ like that until I heard it sung. The creator of the universe, the one through whom all things came into being, dying and growing cold. The one who gave life to the trees of the forest dies on a tree and all of creation shudders. At Christmas, the Creator took a risk, become a part of her creation, and the Word through whom all things came into being became flesh, and we beheld his glory. And Joe, Jesus showed us a way of life that embodied the Creator's love for creation, a love that embraces life fully bringing healing and abundance, a life that learns to live by observing birds and lilies and grains of wheat. When the Creator lived among us, it was the life that we were always meant to live, generous, connected, life-giving, healing, caring for the garden of creation. And yet on Good Friday, we chose autonomy. We chose our own way, and we pushed the Creator out of the world. God might have ended the story of creation right there, pulled the plug on the grand work of millions of years of evolution, given up, let creation die with the creator on the cross. But, but on the first day of the week, the creator stands again among his disciples and says to them, peace be with you. The one we had pushed out of the world cannot leave us alone, even when we've abandoned him. And Jesus says to them, touch me, it's really me. And what to my ears can only sound like Easter humor, he says, have you guys got anything to eat around here? Were this seen to happen today, the disciples would have offered him a slice of leftover pizza from Saturday night's delivery, but they give him a piece of broiled fish and honeycomb and he eats this Mediterranean diet in their presence. The point is this. This is no ghost. This is no disembodied spirit or a warm feeling in their hearts. This is the creator who has refused to abandon creation and who will be inseparably bound with creation forever, a resurrection body at the heart of the Trinity. Easter proclaims a lot of things, the defeat of sin and death, the vindication of the life of Jesus. Easter also emphatically declares this, God loves life. Divine love 
does not abandon material reality, writes theologian Norman Wurzba. Divine love does not abandon material reality because matter itself is the embodiment of love. God loves the smell of green grass and the fertile soil. God loves the call of a bird, the smell of a lily, and the taste of broiled fish and honeycomb. God loves the touch of human bodies. God loves life. God loves this world enough to not abandon even a world that has pushed the Creator out. So on Easter morning, God wipes the sleep from resurrection eyes and once again sees that her creation is good, very, very good. Every Tuesday at our staff meeting, we have devotions and we take turns leading it. Now, it's usually not a Bible verse and a prayer, though sometimes it is that. It's usually more of a thoughtful question that will help us to get to know each other better and to bond more as a staff. Well, I was up for the devotions the day before St. Patrick's Day, and I remembered the beauty of Ireland when Joe and I visited there. And it was a beauty that no doubt sang in Patrick's heart and drew him back to the island, even though his first visit there had been as a captive of pirates. So I asked the, ch the staff at church if there was a special place like the emerald green hills of Ireland that sang in their souls, an outdoor place that's especially meaningful to them. Maddie spoke about summers full of wonder in northern Michigan. Fernando told us about memories with his family at Wood Smoke Ranch. Matt talked about a hidden creek that runs through Duluth, Minnesota. Kurt's special place was the Pawnee Buttes in Colorado. Kevin remembered gardens he had visited in Munich. And Claire had the joy of growing up at the end of a dead-end road that opened up onto a forest preserve. Benny spoke of the waters of Maine and Mackworth Island. And Sarah, she just said, water, water anywhere. Give me water. There's nothing better than listening to someone describe a place that they love. When I was in seventh grade, we lived in Boise, Idaho, and this is the place that I loved. I went to East Junior High on the outskirts of town. Now, junior high for me was tough. Just trying to survive each day emotionally was a struggle. Dad would pick me up after school, and sometimes waiting in the car with him would be our dog, Wimpy. She was a beagle basset hound. Now, when Wimpy was in the car, my heart would leap for joy because it meant that an adventure was coming. On Wimpy days, Dad wouldn't drive home. He'd keep driving east, out of town, and pull into a spot by the Boise River next to an Oregon Trail historical marker sign. It led to a secluded spot he'd found along the river that he used for bird watching. Well, as soon as the door opened, Wimpy would jump out of the car, her basset hound nose hoovering the ground as she bounded towards the river after some elusive scent. Dad would grab a bag, his pair of binoculars, and we'd follow the hound down into a grove of golden aspen trees. The trail ended at a long sandbar facing west across the river. I'd gather firewood. Dad would whittle some green branches into skewers. And as the sun would set across the river, we'd eat roasted hot dogs and listen to the cries of the Canada geese as they settled on down into the river for the night. And the healing that the Creator has woven into creation helped to carry the pain of my adolescent angst. Mary Oliver, in her poem, Wild Geese, writes, you do not have to be good. You do not have to walk on your knees for a hundred miles through the desert, repenting. You only have to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. Tell me about despair, yours, and I will tell you mine. Meanwhile, the world goes on. Meanwhile, the sun and clear pebbles of the rain are moving across the landscapes, over the prairies and the deep trees, the mountains and the rivers. Meanwhile, the wild geese high in the clean blue air are heading home again. 
whoever you are, no matter how lonely, the world offers itself to your imagination, calls to you like the wild geese, harsh and exciting, over and over announcing your place in the family of things. Where is that place for you? Where is the place that God, our creator, has used to restore your soul, to heal you, and has awakened you to your place in the family of things? We receive grace upon grace from God's creation all of our lives. Were it not for the free gifts of the light of the sun and the sustenance of the water, the good earth, there would be no us. On Easter, God embraces the life of creation once again. God embraces the human body, but also the rivers, the aspen trees, and the honking geese. God embraces that part of you that loves creation, the soft animal of your body loves. I have another memory from the Boise River. Replay that same scene. Dad picks me up from school, parks the car by the Oregon Trail. Wimpy runs into the woods, nose to the ground. We head downstream, build a fire, roast hot dogs. But instead of the honking geese, while the sun is setting across the river, we hear the most horrible, howling, gut-wrenching cry. Our faces turn from the fire to the trees, and we know in an instant it's Wimpy. Something is terribly wrong. And we run towards her screams and find the poor dog lying on the ground, her beautiful, soft nose clamped tight in the metal jaws of a hunter's trap. And she's bleeding and whimpering and helpless. Creation suffers because of humanity's insatiable desire for more. Creation suffers because we keep grasping without any thought for the consequences. And the traps that we've set aren't just destroying family, dogs, or wildlife and plants. We trap and we kill human life as well. Adam Toledo, a 13-year-old boy, was trapped. He was shot dead on March 29th with his hands raised in the air by a Chicago police officer. We live in a city in which brown and black bodies are trapped. They're violently policed rather than given the love they need to flourish. The miscarriage of justice that nailed the author of life to a tree on Good Friday continues in our lack of love for the living. Adam Toledo will never again hear the geese cry. He will never again hear them announce his place in the family of things. He won't grow up to fall in love, use his gifts, grow old, and remember about that time when he was in seventh grade. Adam will not grow up because we failed to love his life. Church Council Ben Emmerich forwarded an email from an organization that St. Paul supported last year, fittingly named the Resurrection Project. They worked to build healthy communities in Chicago's Latinx neighborhoods, and they wrote this about the killing of Adam. While we proactively work to eradicate racist policing, we as a society need to apply the same force to expanding opportunities for young men of color to excel in school, the professional world, and life. By focusing on economic empowerment and police reform in communities like the one where Adam lived, we create a foundation for success that promotes life and that stymies senseless murders that kill youth and devastate our communities. That is the creator's will for all of creation, lives that flourish. But we haven't been listening to the wild geese and we have lost our place in the family of things. We keep repeating the same sin of Eden, grasping for more than we need, following our desires without regard for the rest of creation, the rest of humanity, forgetting our place in the world. And we are surprised then when our children, Cain and Abel, end up killing each other. Wendell Berry writes, 
Our destruction of nature is not just bad stewardship or stupid economics or a betrayal of family responsibility. It is the most horrible blasphemy. It is flinging God's gifts in his face. Violence against nature and violence against humanity are all woven into the same cloth. Today we heard Jesus on Easter morning say this to his disciples, proclaim repentance to the nations. Repentance is the message Jesus gives us at Easter. The risen Christ who loves creation knows that repentance is the only way forward for us to live in God's good world. To repent simply means change direction. Stop doing the same destructive things over and over again. Change the way you live. Start going in a new direction. Proclaim repentance to the nations, to the nation, a city that kills 13-year-old boys. Creation was an act of love, overflowing from the heart of God. And on Christmas, out of love, God enters into her creation and on Easter, God sticks with creation. God's only begotten son whom we killed stays with us because God so loved this singular, precious, only begotten world. Science, guilt, shame, they haven't moved our collective imagination enough to change our destructive way of life. It's love, love that must lead us to repentance. For humanity to care for each other, to care for creation, we've got to learn to love creation and our neighbors as we love ourselves. And so I ask again, what is that place in creation that you love? Where do you hear the geese honking, calling to your soul and announcing your place in the family of things. What is that place where, were it to be destroyed and lost forever, it would break your heart? Love it deeply, cherish it, thank God for it, and tell someone about the place you love and ask them to tell you about theirs because there is nothing better than listening to someone describe something they love. May love for our Creator's singular, precious world help us to find our place for everyone in the family of things. Amen.